All right, we are uh, going to finish up this excellent conversation with Dr. Tyler Perry on his book, Jumping the Broom, which is out with UNC Press um, and is exceptional. And now I just wanted to ask a last question um, that will hopefully stimulate the audience to consider um, applying this and more importantly, reading and citing this. And, and I mean that because this is a very important book. So for those who are thinking of new courses like myself, uh, whether they be undergraduate or graduate courses, um, in the Civil War era, uh, why would you advocate that they consider this work or even just, uh, you know, various disciplines, but clearly Civil War, but then also general history buffs as well, because um, I think about how you talk about writing the project as well. Yeah, I mean, because when considering these, you know, broad parameters of the book and the, the many uh, disciplines and areas that it, it gels with, it reminds me of a statement that you know, one of my old undergrad advisors made to me, it was kind of a, a funny statement. And I took it as you know, valuable advice because she said that the difficulty I was going to have in graduate school is that the dissertation has to be a unique single contribution to the historiography. And she said the problem I was going to have was focusing upon one topic to stick with. And so lo and behold, my first book is essentially hundreds of years of history, multiple continents and ocean and different ethnic groups and groups of people who are engaging in a ritual. So I was able to choose a single topic about jumping the broom. It was just it went all of these different directions. And so to the, to the point about assigning this in classes or who would find it of interest, I think the, the first point that I should make is when we're talking about a ritual that has been so singularly important consistently throughout African-American history, from the 19th century all the way to the present, even, even the moments where it was being disregarded by the population, it still remained within the speech patterns and colloquialisms that people employed. So if you, if you are a person who's interested in the Civil War, if you're a person who's interested in you know, the broader parameters of the Civil War and what that meant to people of African descent who were trapped within that particular era, making decisions as to how they would continue their lives post-conflict. If you want to understand 4 million people and understanding that it was 4 million people who were directly impacted by the conclusion of the Civil War and then entering the postbellum era, at the very least, studying and understanding a marital ritual that a large percentage of them use, as far as we can tell, not a majority, but a very significant percentage of people. But I think even engaging marriage in general is kind of a preeminent question because certainly the abolitionists thought that marriage was an important facet of liberation eventually, be they black or white. And so we also have to take seriously the folk ritual that people took very seriously when they were using them. And then when they recounted them, I guess you would say, seven to eight decades later. So if 1865 is the conclusion of the Civil War and people are asked to talk about their experience in the 1930s, they're recounting years and decades of memories that they may or may not have suppressed for all those years. And so the fact that they bothered to mention, we jumped over the broomstick for marriage. We shouldn't just dismiss that. Right. as kind of this folk custom that has no bearing upon how we view the historical past. But if they felt compelled enough to mention it in, under those circumstances, then we should take the ritual seriously and we should do our best to investigate it, right. um, to do justice to the historical record. Right. And so all of that to say that for me, and I think I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, is that my single goal was to ensure that I wrote a book that when people looked at it, they wouldn't just dismiss it as this highfalutin theoretical treatise on what the broomstick wedding may or may not have meant to people, right. but that it is a serious undertaking which I was trying to do my best to understand the individuals that I was studying and taking their words seriously. Because one thing you might notice in the book and, and I've actually been criticized this by some people, not in a you know, particularly mean way, but they have noticed that you quote people a lot 
Like you, you, where's your analysis? You're just right. letting all of these historical figures speak for themselves. And I don't think they, they mean it in a particularly negative way. But one thing you do notice is that I do quote individuals quite often because I think they can say it the best. Right. Um, and then whatever room is left for my analysis, I'll place it within there. So I think the true value of the book is that if you were to assign it in an introduction to African-American studies class, or if you are a person who teaches in Africana studies department yes. and you're teaching an introductory class, you know, this book provides a clear narrative of how important the past is, how important public memory is to consider and to reconsider as we go forward. That the other thing to note is that this should not be the final word on jumping the broom. Yes. In many ways, this should open up a lot of different possibilities from scholars across disciplines. Yes. I would love to see an anthropologist take this up mm. and interview wedding planners or go to okay. weddings where people are using this custom with this new frame of reference. I would love for sociologists to do quantitative surveys mm. about the current importance of the broomstick wedding amongst African-Americans or not even just African-Americans, but the broader diaspora, because right. we know that sometimes it is used um, outside the United States. Right. So there's a variety of different um, trajectories one could take um, from a scholarly perspective. Mm -hmm. But for the general history buff, um, for those who are just interested in the impact of the Civil War era, there is a question when talking about a single ritual as to when does the Civil War era end? Yes. Right. Theoretically, one could say that the impact of the Civil War as it bore upon the wedding traditions or the marital traditions of enslaved people and their descendants is that the Civil War era is in some state of continuity because it's being assessed and reassessed by looking at a particular symbol that has resonance within the past and the present. Now, I might get um, trolled by Civil War scholars or people who believe in the purity of, you know, chronological periods, but from the perspective of somebody who's interested just in the impact of this era, as people have talked about the lost cause or the false cause and the persistence of monuments and commemorations on different sides of the political, social, and cultural aisles, Jumping the Broom, though I'm not specifically referencing the Civil War in every chapter, does manifest within a lot of these broader conversations because we're not talking about a monument necessarily, like a physical item that stands in the public square, but we are talking about a symbol that has endured, right. even when it was suppressed deliberately. Right. by people who wanted to reject it, that somehow it has found a way to continuously be relevant within public discourse at different times. It has ebbed and flowed in popularity, as most things do, but I don't think it's ever going to entirely go away. Okay. And then the next question is, what will be the next resurgent moment? Will there right. be a moment where all of a sudden it's reintroduced into the discourse? Mm -hmm. um, because it's also clear from the book that what we're talking about is different moments where right. things change for very specific reasons, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's eliminated from public memory. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just saying that it makes me wonder, you know, whether it's some public figure, right, or like entertainer or film um, that, um, or miniseries, right, that that kind of resurges that conversation, particularly to a, you know, a new generation of, of youths and people that, you know, may not have been um, immersed in, in, in seen roots. Like I knew roots because my, my family was like, you're going to watch this uh, and you're going to experience this. And, and that was part of my journey and my fascination for history was seeing my people. I think it's, it's interesting though, that you also talk about the, the persistence, right? And that it is a symbol. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a symbol, maybe not in the way of a flag, or like you said, a monument, but it is still important and appropriated, um, <clears throat> which I think is fascinating. I mean, for me, I would love, I would love to see your book also become part of, and even if that wasn't your intention, right? That wedding industrial complex, where it's something that wedding planners uh, have to, to come to terms with, but then also that people getting, you know, going through the processes of, of, of the marriage or, or even a common law that they have to at least, have you read this book? Um, because I'll be honest, that is a question I would have asked 
um, you know, anyone that does it now that I've read the scholarship, which is great. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, another aspect of why I'm glad the book came out now rather than earlier is because when I first engaged the scholarship, because I knew that whatever I contributed to the current historiography had to be unique. I felt like I had to prove myself the entire right, time. Right. So that meant arguing with people that didn't care who I was or never heard my name before. Yeah, and so yes. if you were to ever look at the earlier drafts of Jumping the Broom as like, you know, research papers that I did, I was a bit more snarky to some degree. At a certain point, though, after I had kind of assessed what it was that people were trying to do within uh, public discourse, why they felt it was important to revive the broomstick wedding, I started to understand why, to some degree, symbols acquire mythic histories, why that's actually important to people for kind of self-preservation, particularly in surviving within a country that is foundationally built upon white supremacy. So the idea that you would claim a ritual that may or may not have documentation in the past that you're claiming it to have is still important for people as they're trying to kind of coalesce a, a certain narrative around something they've deemed valuable. And so when I started to write the book or started to conclude the book, writing a few of the last chapters, but particularly the conclusion, I, I kind of switched to suggest that what I really want is for everyone, even if they have written about Jumping the Groom in the past, to be able to approach this book and to appreciate the content. Like, I'm not really arguing with anybody. Um, I'm not as concerned with necessarily being right. I'm just providing the documentation. I'm providing the sources. I'm analyzing them to the best that I can. And if you think I'm wrong at a certain point, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I think that the public discourse should continue upon this particular ritual. And so actually the way that I ended the book uh, without giving too much away is I actually talked about the royal wedding of right, uh, right. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, who, who seemed to continue to come up in the news like ever so often. So that, act, that chapter actually still becomes relevant right. in many ways because they themselves didn't jump the broom, but because of Meghan Markle's heritage, there was a discussion as to whether or not they would. Like how much would African-American traditions be integrated into the royal wedding? And so I actually found that a compelling piece to where I want people to recognize that there is kind of this common stereotype about historians to where we're out of touch because we stay in the past. But the, most of the historians I know, you included, all of us are very much invested in popular culture. We find it interesting because it does inform the way people view the topics we're studying, but I think also we have to reckon with how it might also be influencing the way we approach our own topics as well. That's very true. So for <laughs> me, I was trying to be very honest that, look, here's a historian who is studying marriage, a specific wedding ritual, who's watching the royal wedding to see how it informs this topic. So I, I want to make sure that people find the book approachable, not just an access to the words or does it make sense to people, what type of jargon am I using, right. but literally that the topic itself speaks to something that I think everyone can appreciate. I mean, I just, I would close with that. Um, and I say this particularly as someone who is finishing um, his first book is you, my previous drafts were very, I was trying to put my foot in the sand and then go to war with other scholars. And after a while, I'm just like, I need to just let these people's lives be the, the focus, not what I, you know, and, and, and that's been very important because as you say, even with the, the quoting, you know, the over quoting, which I, I can't stand that <laughs> assessment because that's, you, you know, it's important to let these people's voices be heard. Um, and I say that in my work, I want to, I want to use the quotes effectively to let them tell you what it meant. And I think that's really important. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, um, dive deeper into your project and one that I am going to be assigning for many classes to come and is definitely cited in my book. So I hope others um, do that as well. Where can people follow you? Because you did mention social media and you have a very a good, a great presence, honestly. Um, where can they follow you um, so they can continue to engage in these kind of conversations? 
Yeah, thank you. So first, I'd like to thank you for offering the platform and the opportunity to talk more about the book. Um, it's, it's been a real pleasure to be very, to very, very honest with you. And as far as the way people can find me, I'm, I'm relatively easy to find on the internet, which I don't know if that's a good thing, but I do have a Twitter <laughs> handle. I'm relatively active, except for on the days where my, my children are preventing me from doing anything. Um, I have a handle at prof T D Perry P R O F T D P A R R Y. Probably should have rethought that Twitter handle when I developed it. But uh, I also am the senior editor of the blog Black Perspectives, which is very prominent on Twitter, very easy to find as well. Um, I'm also involved within the African American Intellectual History Society. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, so if you just logged in the website, if you Google searched me, you would find me. I make relatively consistent appearances on news channels and programs and things, but um, I, I, I honestly mean this, that I, I much more enjoy contact from people who are just curious. So I don't care who you are, whatever reputation, whatever your job is that you do, if you are interested in this work, if you have or have not read it, if you wanna ask me a question, send me a message. Those are the types of emails I will respond to very quickly. So thank you very much. And you heard him, folks. Reach out. <laughs> All right. You have a great one. You too. Thank you so much, Holly.